when, when, has, when has Saka ever produced moments of quality? I'm sick of people telling me how, first of all, they keep calling him like, what is it? Star boy, and he's not that kind of player. But when you look at Bakayo Saka, the only thing saving him is that he's left footed in Because he's just not that good. You know, have you looked at his numbers over the last few years? It's better than anybody's. And you can trust him in any phase of the game. Kyle Saka. Saka. Kyle Saka. 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 They'll know soon enough when, when he arrives on their pitch. This story begins in Nigeria, the African giant, the eternal home of Pokayo Saka, and the world's most eccentric place. We have everything here from food to music, dance, culture, and a deep, rich history. We are going to walk. This is a small monkey, Michael Jackson. You know, greet me this morning, Jackson. I told you this was a crazy place. And this is where Saka's parents met. His father was a modest but thriving businessman in Nigeria, constantly on the lookout for opportunities. Saka's mother was also an impressive woman. She was an established veterinarian with many years of practice under her belt. She was also a seasoned financial accountant with a savvy eye. You see, Saka's parents have a great relationship. Somehow they make ends meet. Nigeria is good and okay for them, but every paradise has its problems. <laughs> Um, nationwide protests are taking place at the moment in Nigeria. There is fear now about the Nigerian economy. Plunging Naira and dwindling foreign reserves. When you talk about war, that is lawlessness at its peak. The country they loved started to change. Bad people took control of everything and the quality of life steadily began to decline. Crisis became the norm within the society as violence, chaos, and disorder became societal staples. These changing dynamics forced Saka's parents to make plans to leave Nigeria. They planned to leave Nigeria for a better place where they could build the kind of life they wanted, the life of their dreams. They identified London. And soon after, they took a one-way flight from Lagos to London the financial capital of the world, to start their new life. London was perfect. It was a beautiful place with residents who were equally as ambitious as they were. And on the 5th of September 2001, they received a blessing. A healthy baby boy full of joy. And they named him Bukayo Saka. Bukayo Saka means adds to happiness in their native Yoruba language. You see, Saka's parents don't know it yet, but they have just birthed a baby that will grow up to be one of the world's most inspiring athletes. As a kid, Saka is hardworking and smart. Saka is a straight A student, and all his teachers seem to love him. He was a really good student. Most people thought he would go on to become a doctor or a lawyer or do something else, but Saka had a different calling. Let me tell you something. You see, Saka was in love with football and he got attached to it mainly through his father. One day my dad just took me to my local team, told the guy that I want to play, play football because I love it. Nigerians love football. I speak as one. It wasn't a surprise when Saka's father became a freak and he started taking his son all around London to try out at many local matches where he knew that big scouts would be watching. And that is how Saka got into Arsenal. At the tender age of nine, Bukayo Saka joined Arsenal's academy. Every great journey begins with a single step. And for Saka, that was joining the academy at a young age. Saka was brimming with raw talent. He had a dream to one day play for the first team like every other academy player. During his time in the youth team, he played a lot of games and he was mainly deployed in three positions, left back, left wing, and right wing. But Saka's career really took off when Freddie Jumber, Arsenal's legendary invincible, became his academy coach and mentor. Jumber saw something special in Saka, 
something no other coach at the level could understand. This prompted Jumberg to request that Bukayo Saka be promoted to the under-23 level, but he faced a lot of backlash and heavy criticism from the other coaches. We are now he's playing with 18s, so he's not ready. And I said, there's no chance. Like, if I'm the boss of this team, he's coming up training with me and I'll show you he can play. The other coaches felt that he was too young, too small, too inexperienced for the step up. And even questioned Jumberg asking, why him? Thinking I saw him at the academy, I didn't think he was going to be that good. I'll be honest with you. Eventually, though, Freddy Jumberg will have his way. Saka got into the under 23 level and sat on the fringes of the first team. This was perfect. This was what Saka needed. This allowed him to train with the big boys like Pierre Emerick Aubameyang, Mesut Ozil, and then club record signing Nicolas Pepe. But as fate will have it, Saka would get his chance on the 19th of September 2019. In a game away to Frankfurt, Saka curled in a beautiful shot into the bottom corner from a long range. But this story does not become all rosy from here. Oh, I, I wish it did, but Arsenal fell into deep, deep crisis. Then Arsenal manager Unai Emery was fired for underperforming. He had a lot of time, a lot of chances to turn things around. They, they wanted to believe in him. Saka's longtime mentor, Freddy Jumberg, was then drafted in as an interim manager. That worked well, but it had little help. Eventually, Arsenal settled on Mikel Arteta from Manchester City. But he too would become a victim of circumstance. Arsenal had problems, inherited from the previous administration, and Arteta was left with basically no attacking midfielder. Club star Mesut Ozil went to war with him and all the other number 10 options at the club were either washed or injured. Arteta had no choice but to look for the next best solution and that was to play Saka, a little kid, as the attacking midfielder. Everyone squirmed at the idea. Everyone except Saka and Arteta. Saka took the role on brilliantly by playing as an attacking midfielder for Arsenal. The club suddenly started to win games and Saka started to win the fans over. The challenges though wouldn't stop. Arteta then had a left back crisis and Arteta at the time had no other candidate but Bukayo Saka to play there simply based on his left footedness. You want to know what's crazy? Saka played the left back position. He basically became one of the world's best left backs and I'm not exaggerating. Take a look at this chart. Saka as a left back was outperforming every single player at his age grade within Europe in that position whipping in dangerous deliveries into the box, beating opponents for fun every match day while slicing through them. He delivered the best cutbacks into the penalty area for his incoming attackers to feast on. By the time Arsenal had stabilized and began to make some signings like Martin Odegaard to come take over the attacking midfield position, Bukayo Saka had appeared as a sub or a starter on the left wing, right wing, left back, right back, left midfield, right midfield, and even the attacking midfield position on number 10. Imagine this, a kid tasked with playing all these positions at the highest level in the world's most physical, brutal, and tactically demanding league. Arsenal had a superstar and they knew it. Bro, when you look at like James Milner, bro, Saka looks like a black James Milner, but he's left footed. Energy, physical attributes, stamina, bro, he's, he's Nigerian anyway. Aesthetics. The brand of philosophy and study concerned with beauty, art, and taste. Exploring what makes things visually, sensorially, and emotionally pleasing. You see, as humans, we are naturally attracted to beautiful things. Studies even show that babies spend more time looking at attractive and symmetrical faces than they do looking at average or unattractive people. This preference might be hardwired into our DNA and it seems we can't do anything to help it. Here's a little test for you. Take these two subjects, subject one and subject two. Who is more handsome, the guy on the left or the guy on the right? If your answer was the guy on the left, this is good. You understand and appreciate aesthetics. However, the problem is that this judgment criteria often spills into football and clouds our collective perceptions of a player's ability. But I, I think sometimes when you watch Phil Foden, there's a beauty of the way he plays the game. There's that like silky little touch and he's got a very good football brain on him. And I think with uh, Saka, it, he looks more of a, an efficient player. You see, I believe that Saka is one of football's biggest victims of aesthetics bias. 
Players like Phil Foden often get called superior to him, and players like Jude Bellingham are also big victims of aesthetics bias. But you see, the list of aesthetics bias victims is a long one. Klaas Jan Huntelaar, Thomas Muller, Kai Havertz, Jorginho, and even Yaya Toure. I find Toure's case really interesting because he was in a deep hole reinforced by another layer of racial bias. If I can put this in a non-conspicuous way, Toure, like Saka, was a black footballer. And throughout his career, Toure was constantly stereotyped and played in defensive and recovery-heavy positions simply because of his height, size, power and perceived physical gifts. But sometimes the bias is even more subtle. You don't realize it has started to plant its seeds and germinate until you really pay attention. Your Arsenal career, you started on the left as well. Um, Ian Wright, Gary Neville, a couple of people have come out and, and suggested that that could be a good position with you based on the personnel that we have um, in this tournament. What, what do you think of that? I feel more comfortable on the right and I think that's where I play best. So You see, this thing is the reason why a lot of people don't really understand Saka because you can't really put him into any of these boxes. He's a unicorn. I would categorize Saka as a white playmaker, a player that acts as the team's main source of creativity. As teams become more positional with their setups, the archetypal number 10 is being phased out of the modern game, and the burden of creativity now rests upon the white men. This is why you're suddenly seeing all sorts of white playmakers pop out at big clubs Ademola Lukman, Jack Grealish, Kulusevski, Olise. Yamal and Kvicha. Looking at Saka, the first thing that stands out about him physically is how built his thigh muscles are. He's really, really strong and always ready for combat. He rarely shies away from physical challenges and his strength is nuts. It's for me, it's your goal because you won the battle with Declan, Declan Rice in midfield. It doesn't matter the size of the opponent he's up against. Going to the gym lately. <laughs> the guy is built like a stallion and it's really hard to knock him off the ball. But you know, physical strength is just level one for Saka. He has really strong glutes. By glutes, I'm referring to his fanny, his tootsie, his rear end, his bum. Ugh. Now, hold on. I know it sounds funny, but walk with me. What's that, brother? Bombs are actually an important footballing weapon. It was Yaya Touri who explained this in his article for the athletic title why bombs are so important in football. Using the hips and backside to absorb the shock of contact allows players create momentary space which they could then use to escape pressure. Players like Eden Hazard, Frank Ribéry, Harry Kane and Bukayo Saka are masters of this. You see, guys like Doku and Bakayoko are your typical pacey white men with electric speed and fear factor when approaching fullbacks. But Saka isn't like this. He's not particularly quick off the mark when you watch him and he's not really tricky or flashy, yet he's one of the world's best players. What makes Saka so special is actually that mass located in between his ears. I'm talking about his brain. Let me explain. You see, the problem aesthetics merchants have when they watch Saka and do the prescribed eye test is that they compare his baseline traits to other players who are more superior at them. This makes them come to the conclusion that he is average. I look at Saka as a winger and I do not think he has an outstanding attribute. I don't think he's that much of a goal threat like that. He's not the best dribbler in the world. He's he's not the fastest. They watch him running down the wings and compare his speed to Gordon. They watch him doing back post crosses to Trossard and compare his back post crossing to Yamal's. They see him shooting from long range and quickly compare his shooting to that of Rodrigo or Eberichi Eze who unleash thunderbolts every week. Yet, it doesn't dawn on the aesthetics merchants that maybe, just maybe, Saka's biggest trait is that he's in conversations with all the world's best players at their elite traits. What I'm driving at here is best described through a graph called the domain of specificity versus generality. Here's the graph. Meet specificity. This is the area where the world's best players retain their elite traits. I'm talking about guys like Tony Cruz with the world's best passing. That said, a player could become too specific and get into an area of fixedness. This is a purgatory where one-dimensional players exist. Guys like Mikhailo Mudrik, 
meet generality. Here, the world's most versatile players retain their traits. I'm talking about guys like Lucas Vasquez. The risk, though, with generality is that a player becomes too general and gradually begins to morph into a footballer that is superficial. This is also a purgatory where extremely versatile but blunt players reside. Players like Gabriel Jesus. But you see, what is so unique about Saka is that he sits right in the sweet spot of the specificity versus generality debate. He's right in the domain sensitivity zone, the place where the perfect footballer on paper exists. He's not the world's best crosser, but he's arguably top three. He's not the world's best dribbler, but he's top three. He's not the world's most creative guy, but he's top three, even rivaling attacking midfielders for output. I remember when my uncle used to say that Saka is like a World War II code breaker. You see, most of those guys were hardcore mathematicians and intellectuals, debugging complex algorithms the Germans created. And that's why Arsenal fans valued him so much, even when the numbers were not doing justice to his talent. That's why the England camp cannot drop Saka from that right wing position, even though ballers like Cole Palmer and Philip Walter Foden are constantly knocking on the door. Opponents know this, and that's why they spend every hour of their miserable and pathetic lives coming up with strategies to double mark and triple mark Saka out of games. The next time you see teams crowd Saka as a strategy, just remember that they are not trying to cage his body, but they are attempting to cage his mind. Saka is now a complete footballer, one enveloped in confidence and possessing a healthy amount of arrogance. You know, it was Thierry Henry who once told Saka that he needed to upgrade one level higher by becoming less humble. If you want to be big, if you want to be the guy, big players are not nice. Saka took this advice and ran with it. Now he has that nasty edge. I like how visible this is to everyone when he scores today. The old Saka was beaming with joy whenever he scored a goal. But today you see him with that arrogant flinch. He's got a frown, body language as if to say, this is what I do, get used to it. How refreshing that Arsenal star boy has now become a man. Time flies. And perhaps it is now time for Saka to pass on the star boy torch to the next Nigerian British kid coming through Arsenal's ranks. I'm talking about Ethan Wanieri. Word on the street is that we might be doing an Ethan Wanieri video, so don't forget to subscribe to this channel so you don't miss it. Until next time, bye bye.